Uh, please open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. In the last two sessions, we had an introduction with regard to the gospel. We looked at the exhortations to make the gospel center in our lives, in our ministries, and in our churches. We also looked at the warnings that the gospel is the gospel of God. We have no right to change it, and we have no right to repackage it in order to make it fit to a new and modern or contemporary society. We must be faithful to the gospel. We must be faithful to the doctrine, to the truth that has been once and for all handed down to the saints. I'm going to continue to try to talk a little slower even than I did last night so that uh, the translators can have a, a breath in between words. So it's kind of hard for me because usually I get going and I don't know when to stop, so I'm trying to be very paused. We'll now look at a passage of Scripture which has been considered by many theologians to be the most important passage in the entire Bible. Some have referred to it as the Acropolis or the fortified city of the Christian faith. The things that are found here are not anything less than essentials. It is absolutely mandatory that you understand the truths in this passage if you are to truly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I've said today, I said yesterday, the world is not so much hardened to the gospel as it is ignorant of the gospel because the gospel is not being preached. And I think it's not being preached because so many men today in the pulpits do not delight in the gospel. They do not see the gospel as worthy of first place, but as some kind of uh, first class in Christianity or some kind of baby step in Christianity only to go on to supposedly greater things, which is simply not true. Well, let's read our passage. Let's begin in verse 23. For all have sinned, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come before you today well aware that this passage and the truths that it contain are worthy of much more than what any man can give them. Lord, that if we were to spend our lives looking at just this passage, we would still not even begin to exhaust the truths that are found here. But Lord, with the time that we have, please, for the glory of your own Son, for the benefit of your people, help us to both communicate and to receive and understand the great truths that are found in this text. That Christ might be honored, that he might be esteemed with the worth that is truly his. In Jesus' name, amen. We start with a simple verse that most of us studied when we were children. Probably one of the first verses that most people memorize for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When something becomes common, when something is heard over and over again, 
it loses its meaning. For example, when I came here to Norway and I saw some of your beautiful forests and the, the rocks and the small islands coming out of the sea and the wind and the, and the mountains that you have, I was amazed at the beauty. And yet you walk by them every day. You see, you see them all the time. And so you're not so amazed. It's like that in Scripture. We hear something over and over until it no longer has much meaning. Another illustration could be this. The first time your wife or your husband, the first time they ever told you, I love you. What a shock ran through your body when you heard those words. But then 20 years later, you say, I love you back and forth every day. And it doesn't seem to have the same power. It's become common. You just say it. You hear it without even hearing it oftentimes. And so when we see something over and over, it loses its meaning. He says, for all have sinned. If we truly understood who God is, this statement would terrify us. It would almost disintegrate our psyche. It would tear open our hearts. And, but we hear sin today. We hear about sin. And it doesn't have that big of an impact on our life. And so one of the things that Scripture calls us to do is to understand the attributes of God. And in that, understand what sin truly is. As the... Puritans used to say the sinfulness of sin. The heinous nature of this thing. How vile, how loathsome, what an abomination that sin truly is. Now this must be discovered by the sinner at least to some degree before he can be converted. And then as Christians, you and I in a sense should grow in our loathing our hatred of sin. That the more we taste the purity of God in Christ, the more we will turn from sin, hating sin. Now, he says, for all have sinned. Here we see, first of all, the universality of sin. All have sinned. Since Adam, every man has sinned. As a matter of fact, if we were to take one characteristic or one, yes, one characteristic and use that to identify man, that one characteristic would be sin. It would not be virtue. It would be sin. It would not be moral merit. It would be moral failure. Not only with each individual man, but as the human race as a whole. Now, now think about it. If you look at, at just go back even less than a hundred years, the wars that we have experienced, terrifying, tragic loss of humanity. What was the cause of it? Sin. The fact that even today as I speak, thousands of unborn babies around the world will be murdered in the womb. And what is that the result of? It's the result of sin. Now, what is sin? Here, we're using the Greek word amartano, which means to miss the mark. Now, the way to illustrate this would be if I had a bullseye or a target in the back of the room and I had a bow and arrow, and I pulled back the bow and I shot the arrow and I missed the center of the target. Not only missed the center of the target, but missed the target completely. That's kind of the idea. Or if I didn't draw the bow back far enough and when I let the arrow go, it didn't even reach the target. Now, what is the target? The target is the revealed will of God. That's the target. The law of God that he has revealed through the scriptures, but he has also revealed to every man, every man riding it upon his heart and the conscience of every man bearing witness. So we have all fallen short of this. Now, if I just say 
that sin is falling short of the standard, it seems like sin is an error. Sin is a mistake. Sin is just something that we happen to do that we don't want to do. But when you look at the full teaching of Scripture with regard to sin, that's not the case at all. Sin is rebellion. Sin is a crime. Sin is when man puts his will, his volition, against the person of God and against God's law. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is obvious rebellion. Intentional rebellion. And all of us have rebelled against God. Now, when we talk about sin, we need to understand that sin is more than just an act. People are not sinners because they sin. People sin because by nature they are sinners. And that's very important to understand. If you see sin as simply an act or a decision, you will treat sin superficially and you will try to find a superficial cure. But sin is not merely a decision. It goes all the way into the heart of man, a heart that is fallen, a heart that is can be properly called morally depraved, a heart that is spiritually dead. Now, we're going to take a look for just a moment at that heart. And I want us to go to the book of Genesis. Chapter 6, verse 5. This is prior to the flood of Noah. As a matter of fact, it's the reason for the flood of Noah. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, listen to the language. It's very important language. He says that the wickedness of man was great. Now, this is in God's estimation. It was, it was gigantic. It was pervasive. It was, it was through and through, affecting absolutely everything that man is and that man did. That it was great on the earth. And every intent of the thought of a man's heart was only evil. Every intent was only evil. And then the adverb continually, always, ongoing, again, pervasive evil. Now, someone may object to that. And they may say, well, no, my thoughts aren't like that. Well, let me do something to you that I did to a young reporter many years ago when he said that. We were in a very large auditorium. He came up. He was very angry. He said, I don't believe man is as bad as you say he is. And I said, sir, I did not say that man was bad. I read the scriptures and the scriptures said that men were bad because he claimed to be a Christian. He said, men are not that bad. I said, sir, if I could take out your heart right now, and I'm say the same thing to you. If I could take out your heart right now, all the thoughts that you have ever had from the moment you began realizing that you were thinking, even until now, even the thoughts you've had in the last 15 minutes in this room. And I could take those thoughts and I could put them on a DVD. And I could show that DVD here today. You would run out of this room and you would never show your face here again. You know that's true. You would do everything in your power to keep me from showing everyone the thoughts of your heart throughout the full course of your life. 
Now, I want you to think about this. You would be utterly ashamed, even though you know everyone in the room is just like you. You would still be utterly ashamed. Now imagine this, the day of judgment, and you stand before God, a holy God. And all this is revealed in front of him and before a holy heaven. You see, man, his own heart testifies to the truthfulness of Scripture. Let's let's go on. Genesis chapter eight. Verse 21, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. It says the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. The flood washed away almost all men from planet Earth. But here we see after the flood, that not even the flood could wash man's heart. Even from his youth, the word can mean more than just a youth, to go back to, to a child or children. And this is something that is very important, very debated, but nonetheless, the scriptures are clear. And on this, I, I look for no compromise. I, I hope to make no truce. The scriptures are clear. Men are born in sin. Men are born radically corrupt. Sometimes I will hear, you know, some type of song about, you know, the world would be full of peace if only children led us. Obviously, the person who wrote that song has never had a child. Let me give you an example. Let's take a, a four-year-old child or even a three-year-old child. Let's put him in a room all by himself and let's give that child every toy imaginable. I mean, just place one toy after another, after another in front of that child. And then as we're doing that, we find a toy that the child does not want. And so we put the toy back in the child's hand and the child throws it away. We put it back in the child's hand. He throws it away. He even becomes angry. He doesn't want the toy and he throws it away. And we do it again and again to prove the child does not want the toy. But I can make that child want that toy more than all the other toys that he loves. How? I bring another child of the same age into that room. And I give that child that toy that that other child does not want. And what happens? World War Three. <laughs> now, I want you to look at that. Now, we laugh and I know the story's funny, but I want you to realize something. That is the reason for World War Two. That is the reason for 30 million Russians dying in World War II. That is the reason for 6 million Jews dying in World War II. That is the reason for all the murders that will happen today. Notice that you do not have to teach a child to be selfish. You do not have to teach a child to be angry or even violent. You do not have to teach a child to lie. As a matter of fact, you have to spend a great deal of energy to teach them to do the opposite. And that's why the world and its social ideas are so wrong to the point of absurdity. Absurd, absolutely contrary to reality. People say, no, you just you just make society better and the child will be better. Do you realize, and it's hard for us because we no longer study history. If you're living in the United States, Canada or Western Europe, you have the most affluential, easiest life that history has ever known. 
and yet we are the most violent and incontent people. There's no contentment about us. Constantly wanting more, constantly warring, constantly angry, constantly depressed. My dear friend, people say, well, it's society that deforms the child. Do you not realize of what society is made? Of adults, just like the child. Sooner or later, all this problem has to make its way back to man and the heart of man. And that is the problem. Man must be changed. He must be because he is a sinner. The Bible says that man loves self more than God. That man loves the pleasures of sin more than the righteousness of God. The Bible teaches that all men are born as haters of God. If you ever hear someone talk about, well, you know, we just, uh, someone who is outside of the Christian faith, outside of Scripture, and they say, well, I love God. No, they do not. They don't. Or someone says, ever since I was born, I loved God. No, you did not. You say, yes, I did. No, you didn't. You loved a figment of your own imagination. You loved a God that you made. And then you loved that God you made. Do you see that? That is why oftentimes, if a pastor asks me to come to his church and teach on the attributes of God, I will say, are you sure? It's kind of dangerous, don't you think? And he'll say, what do you mean it's dangerous? And I said, well, I don't want to split your church. Split my church? We're, we're Christians. We're religious. We, our, our, our thing is about God. Why are you saying this, Brother Paul? And I say this, listen. If I stand up before your church and I teach the classical view of God as it is revealed in Scripture and it is held by at least the reformers and the old evangelicals. If I teach that view of God, you will have people in your church after about the third or fourth day that are so mad they can't stand it. And many of them may even stand up and say, I could never love a God like that. That's not my God. No, it's not. It's not their God. And the God they worship every Sunday is not the true God. It's a God they made in their mind according to the lusts of their own heart. And that's much of evangelical Christianity and much of what is coming into Norway from the United States is people who have made a new God. A God of prosperity, a God of easy life, a God of miracle, a God who takes away all suffering, a God who would never demand anything from you except what your flesh would approve. That's not the God of the Bible. And that's why so many people are running to that God. And like I've said so many times, if we gave a conference on signs, wonders, healings, and easy life, we would have the entire stadium full. But if we gave a conference on the attributes of God, you would find it difficult to get a hundred people there. Why? Because the Christianity, for the most part, within evangelicalism, has a God that is no God at all. And that's all there is to it. Now, you say, what right do you have saying things like this? You standing there all by yourself against most of evangelicalism, and there you are. Who do you think you are? Well, if I was up here telling you something that was new, that was just my interpretation, you ought to have some doubts. But here's the thing. If we go back through 2,000 years of Christian history and we look at the God of our fathers and their fathers, and I'm talking about our spiritual fathers, if we looked at the God of the early evangelicals, the God of the reformers, 
the God of the underground church during the reign of Catholicism, the God of the first century church, we would see that that God looks nothing like most of what's called God in the evangelical community today. Nor does Christianity look like what Christianity as it is seen today looks like. Yes, we are living in very, very disturbing times. Now, since man is a sinner, he hates God. Society, by and large, hates God, the one true God. You could walk down the street of almost any major city in the world and you could cry out Buddha and no one would be angry with you. You could cry out Muhammad and no one would be angry with you. But if you cry out Jesus Christ, crucified and raised from the dead, they will turn on you. If you talk about a God of love, they will have you on every TV station in the world. But if you talk about a God of righteousness, they will call for your death. Not only outside of Christianity, but inside of Christianity, men hate God. Now, here's the question. Why do men hate God? And the answer may be a surprise. Men hate God because God is good. Why do men hate God's law? Because it's good. Well, why would anyone hate a good law from a good God? They would do so only if they are inherently evil. I will sometimes mention the law, not just in a secular university, but even in a Christian setting. And oftentimes, even among those who claim to be Christians, I see their face twist up and they get angry and they start talking about legalism. And they start telling me, you're not going to impose that law upon us, we're free. And so I'll always ask them this question. So you're, you're telling me that the law is oppressive to you and to your actions. Yes, they say. And then I'll say this, which one? Which law? Is it the one that says you shall not lie? Bear false witness? Does that oppress you? If it oppresses you, it's because, well, you're a liar. And you love your lies. Is it oppressive to you and evil to you that God says you shall not commit adultery? Is that oppressive to you? If it is, it's because you're an adulterer. You know, I always ask people, which law is it that you hate? And if you do hate these kind of laws, then what does that say about you? Do you see that? And so, here we see in, in the book of Genesis that from the very beginning, this is what we are. Do you realize that so many people today, even within the evangelical community, they believe that hell is immoral? I mean, that's the big question. How could God send men to hell, such a terrible place, for eternity. They think it's immoral. And you know what? Their reasoning is correct. They think it's immoral because they do not believe men are evil. They think men are basically good, mistaken, misguided, misunderstood. And therefore, logically, they would conclude that such a punishment as hell would be immoral for someone who is mistaken. And just in error. But here's what I want you to see. If we take seriously what the scripture says about men. All men. Then this is what you need to understand. Well let me, let me put it this way. If I said that Hitler was in hell. Which he is. Hardly anyone would have a problem with that. I mean, look at all the people he killed. Even in your own country. 
So if I said Hitler was in hell, most people would say, yeah, that, that's right. Mussolini's in hell, okay. Right. See, here's the problem. You think Hitler was an anomaly, that he was a rarity. Here's the other problem. You think he's worse than you. See, what you don't understand is this. What you see in unbelieving men when they do acts of some sort of kindness or when they don't murder a lot of people, you think that's a good man. No, that's the grace of God restraining men. If it were not for the common grace of God restraining the human race, we would all make Hitler look like a choir boy. So what you're seeing when you see normal people is you're not seeing normal people. What you're seeing are people given over to evil who are restrained by the grace of God so that the world does not tear itself apart so that history can continue and God can do a work of redemption. But on judgment day, the grace that you see will be removed from that person and you will see what they really are and you will no longer believe that hell is immoral. But that it is just. And it is right. See, we don't understand man. He is a fallen creature. Someone always asks me, they always go, what about the good atheist? And I always answer by saying this, well... Could you give me his name? Because I hear about him everywhere and I would really like to talk to him, but I've never met him. The good atheist, what about him? Here's what you need to see. Let's see that there's an atheist who helps elderly women, is basically a nice guy. If the, your battery's dead on your car because the weather's so cold, he'll give you a charge. He's a, he's a decent person. What about him? What about him? Maybe the most severe judgment of God is revealed, is waiting for him. And you say, why? Because the only reason he's able to do those things is because of the common grace of God restraining his evil, the very God he denies. So he takes credit for his virtue, when actually it's not virtue, his virtue, it's the virtue of God's grace, the very God that he denies. Do you see that? Again, let me say it very clearly. If it were not for the common grace of God restraining the evil of men, we would all make Hitler look like a choir boy. And that is the argument, basically, in Romans chapter 1. You see, in Romans chapter 1, there is this long list of brutal sins, horrible sins that are mentioned throughout the entire chapter. Now, many people think, well, those sins will result in the judgment of God. If a society commits those sins, it will result in the judgment of God. That's not what that passage is teaching. That passage is teaching something completely opposite. It's saying basically this, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. That's the great sin. Therefore, in judgment, God turned them over to the lusts of their own flesh so that they then committed all these crimes. So if you see these types of sins in society, it does not mean that God is going to judge your country. It means he already has. And what is the great sin of Romans 1? Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Therefore, God turned them over. Now, even in that turning over, there's some restraint that still remains. But on the day of judgment, even that restraint will be pulled back. And in hell, there will be no such restraint. And all you will see are monsters. Another thing that you need to understand about hell, the reason why it is eternal, because you make a terrible mistake. 
you think that people who go to hell repent and are sorry and want to get out. And that's not true because they are now turned over to their evil. And if God were to throw open the door of hell right now and tell everyone you are free to come out, all you have to do is bow your knee to my sovereignty, they would slam the door in God's face. Why? They hate him that much. And why do they hate him? Because he is good. Why would anybody hate a good God? Only because they are evil. There was a man who worked in, in criminal law and he was a policeman and he was over many policemen. I heard about this, this man years and years ago and he gave, us, he gave a talk and he said after all his experience on police forces, dealing with crime, everything else, this is the conclusion he came to. Let's say you're holding an 18-month-old baby in your arms and that baby reaches for your watch and you say no. And it reaches for your watch again and you say no. And it reaches for your watch again and you say no and it starts screaming and moving its arms and frailing and twisting its body. He said, from my experience, if that 18-month-old baby had the strength of an 18-year-old man, it would slaughter its father and mother at that very moment, rip the watch off their arm and walk out the door leaving bloody footprints without feeling one ounce of remorse in their heart. Now, why am I saying this? Isn't it amazing that God would send his son to die for people like that? Why am I saying this? Because it's true. Why am I saying this? Because very few people are. This is what you and I are apart from the grace of God. And that is why you would not want your thoughts to be published here this morning. Even now. Even just the thoughts you've had while being at this conference. Even the thoughts you've had about me as I've stood up here speaking. Do you see? Hitler is not an anomaly. He's a picture of what every man is. Apart from the restraining grace of God. All have sinned. And then it says, and fallen short. Well, let, let's go a little bit farther on that before we close. Let's go to Isaiah. Sixty four. Isaiah sixty four, verse six. For all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Like one who is unclean. This is. Possibly a reference to leprosy. At least we'll use that as an illustration of what this means. I don't know if any of you have ever been around lepers. I have. Leprosy comes in different kinds and different stages, but the worst kind of leprosy is. Well. If that leper was outside this room, you would smell him before he came in. And let's say he did come in and he's standing here and he's just a mass of rotten flesh, blood, body fluid, infection. And you all decide that you want to do something to help him. So you go to the largest city in Norway or maybe go down to Paris, France, and you buy the most beautiful white silk or cloth that you can afford and you bring it back and you wrap the man from head to toe in that beautiful cloth. And for a moment, he looks presentable, 
But then what happens? The corruption of his body begins to bleed through the cloth until the cloth becomes just as corrupt as the man inside. That is the reason why your good works cannot save you. They are utterly permeated and corrupted by the sin within, by the moral corruption of your heart. Our most righteous deeds before God are like filthy rags. And that is why we cannot be saved apart from a supernatural, grace abounding work of redemption. This is why the death of God's Son, having suffered the wrath of God, was absolutely essential. There could never be thought, we could never think of a more severe remedy than the cross of Christ. Why did it have to be so severe? Because our malady was so severe. Our malady is so severe. This is what we are. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 3. So many people object to talking about sin. As a matter of fact, some of the popular preachers in America now boast that um, they don't mention sin in their churches. Well, I can tell you this. If they do not mention sin in their churches, the Holy Spirit is not in their churches and he is not working in their churches at all. And you say, how can you make that statement? I can make it biblically. Because Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. One of his main ministries would be to convict the world of sin. So if you see a minister walking around who boasts that he does not talk about sin, but he wants to be more positive, I can guarantee you the Holy Spirit is not in his ministry at all. Here's the funny thing is some people will say, but how can you say that? Well, because the scripture said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. And then they go, but still, how can you say that? Well, because the Bible says, you see, people don't listen to the Bible anymore. They, they find a way around it. If you go into a group of people and they're all doing crazy things that are not in the scriptures and you say, this is not in the scriptures then what happens? They go, well, we know it's not in the scriptures. But that doesn't mean it's not of God. Hold it. You're doing things that entire entirely contradict the scriptures. Yeah, but that you can't limit God. I can limit God. I can limit God to not contradicting his scriptures. God will not contradict the scriptures he has written. Now, I want you just to think for a moment. In the Bible, we don't have a book of the Bible that would be considered a systematic theology. Okay, But the closest thing that we do have to that would be Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Now, he writes 16 chapters. I find it very interesting that the first three chapters are dedicated almost entirely to sin, to man's sin and to showing men their sin. Now, isn't that amazing? Christianity has a lot of things to talk about. I mean, a lot of things. But Paul dedicates the first three chapters with one solemn purpose. And what is that purpose? To condemn everybody. Just look for a moment at verse 9 of chapter 3. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. That was Paul's charge against them. And now he's going to bring scripture after scripture after scripture to prove his point. There is none righteous. 
The right, righteous means conformity to a standard or being straight. So if this is my standard and I'm like this, then I'm righteous. I'm conformed to this standard. But if the standard is like this and I'm like this, I am not righteous. Another word that can be used, I am morally twisted or perverted. And so the Bible says there is no man who is righteous. And then I find it interesting that Paul says, no, not one. It's almost as though he anticipates man's objection. He says there is none righteous. And someone says, yes, I know, but. And Paul says, no, not one. Then he goes on, there's none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. No one seeks for God. In the Greek, this means no one seeks for God. God is the initial seeker. God is the one who seeks for man. Many old preachers used to say it like this. Man seeks for God in the same way that a criminal seeks for a policeman. Man does not seek for God and man does not understand. And you say, what do you mean he doesn't understand? If in the last 2000 years there have been great, great strides in technology. In the last 20 years, the world has been transformed by an increase in knowledge. And yet, as we see man increasing in his technology, he becomes more and more absurd with regard to the primary truths of our existence. As evolution begins to prove itself to be more and more absurd, scientists are now looking for little green men who came and deposited garbage or something on our planet that eventually evolved into us. Even though in one aspect our intellect increases, in another we become more and more absurd. No one understands. Now you say, how can God judge a man if the man doesn't understand? The man does not understand not because he lacks the capacity to understand. He does not understand because he does not want to understand. He lacks the will. It's not that he cannot, he will not. And why does he will not? Because he hates God. It's just like when someone says, and Jesus says, man cannot come to him. Man cannot come to Christ. Men cannot on their own initiative come to God. Why? Is it because they lack the faculties to do so? No. They have the faculties to come to Christ, to come to God. Why don't they? Because they hate him. Because they hate the light. And the closer they get to the light, the more it is exposed that their deeds are evil. That's why men hate Christ. Why do people hate Christianity? I mean, think about it. Why would anybody hate a God who so loves the world, he sends his only begotten son to die for that world? Why would you hate a God like that? Well, here's the reason. Because he says we're wrong. And that's something we can't tolerate. You can believe anything today as long as you do not say that someone else is wrong. The moment you say someone else is wrong, people start yelling for your execution. That's the same way. I don't want the love of God if he's going, if he does not accept me as I am. And we see that reverberate through everything in society. 
There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. Here's one thing to think if you're a church member that I think is very important. So many people believe they're Christians within the church when they are not. One of the characteristics of a person who is not Christian is that they are useless to God. So many people think that because they attend church on Sunday, they've done, they've completed, fulfilled their moral responsibility. But they are not useful to God. They do nothing in God's name and according to God's will to advance his kingdom. They come, they watch, they leave, but they're useless. One of the great characteristics of a truly converted person is that what? What will happen? They will bear fruit. He says they've become useless. Now, here's the big one. Verse 12. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, if we were to leave this building right now and go throughout all of Norway, all of Europe, United States, Canada, anywhere else, and we asked people, if you died right now, where would you go to he would you go to heaven? Those people who do believe that God exists and those people who do believe there is a heaven and a hell, almost all of them would say, I would go to heaven. Why? Because I'm good. Because I've never killed anybody. I guess that's the, the evidence that you're good. We've kind of lowered the standard, haven't we? Most people answer, I'm good. And yet look at what God says. There is none who does good. There is not even one. One of the reasons or the only way you can think that you are good is to lower the standard. Those people who believe they are good enough have done one of two Fatal made one or of two fatal errors or maybe both of them at the same time. They have either believed that they are better than they are or they believe that God is not as good as he is. And remember what God said to Israel in the book of Psalms. You thought I was like you. He said that was your error. You thought I was like you. He is not like us in any shape, form or fashion. So it says there is none good, not even one. Then verse 13, their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving the poison of asp is under their lips. Now, I've seen an open grave. I don't know if any of you have seen open graves, but I've seen open graves. After people have been buried in them for a long time. I remember one time in Peru, there was a great flood and it washed up all the caskets out of the cemetery and floated them into the center of the town. All right, an open grave is not very appealing. And he says here their throat is an open grave. Now he's talking about the mouth with the tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. The mouth of a man. The Bible talks about the mouth. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Jesus said, out of the mouth, what is revealed? The heart. The way we talk about people. The things that come out of our mouth. And it just keeps getting worse and worse in our society. A few years ago, I was in London and I was teaching on family. And a person asked me about homeschooling. So I started sharing it. And one person stood up and said, well, if your children are homeschooled and they're not with other children all the time, how will they be socialized? That's always the question. And so I looked at them and I said, you know, last night after I preached, it was late and I was hungry. So we went down to High Street looking for fish and chips. 
And while I was walking down High Street, there were teenagers everywhere. I'm talking about girls, you know, 12, 13 years old, just masses of young people in their young teens. And I said, as I walked through there, I heard 13 year old girls say things and do things that I never heard in my worst days when I spent most of or my worst days and nights when I spent most of that time in bars and taverns. I heard those girls talk like I've not heard hardened sailors talk in my day. So just how do you want those children to socialize and influence my children? Do you know that sometimes I've been in some of the most darkest places in the world, the jungles, in midst of false religions in Eastern Europe, all sorts of things. I have a sense of more darkness and more evil when I walk through a public school than when I'm in those places. The things that come out of the mouth today It just demonstrates the heart. And this is the case in many human elements. Let me give you an example. Art. Art. I remember in, uh, I was in the city of Lima where I lived in Peru. And, and always in the plazas they would have these artists that would come and paint these beautiful scenes of the Amazon or the Andes Mountains. and the Just, just beautiful, talented people. You just couldn't believe... But there in the center of the plaza, they had a, an area where they would always have these uh, indoor art exhibitions. And that's where all the real artists showed their stuff. And it was always dark and morbid and distorted. I remember walking in this one room and it was just white walls and a white background. There was nothing in the whole room. It was just all white. And at the end, there was a little television set like this with a DVD player or a video player. And you walked over there and it was art and you pressed the button and it was a naked woman in a bathtub cutting both her wrists and bleeding to death. If you look at art today and the darkness of it and the distortion of it, you see the inside of man. And you also see, even in something like Picasso, you see that it's not trying to imitate the Creator, but taking the Creator, what He has done, the image of a man, and distorting it entirely. So it's completely something else. A figure with both eyes on the same side of the head. That it's just a distortion of the creative work of God. These are all expressions of the interior of a man. And then it says in verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Mouth full of cursing and bitterness. Would anyone dispute with me on that? You know, sometimes I try to look up a weight training program or something for my sons, for their weightlifting or whatever they're doing. And, and I, even on that... I have to go and I have to make sure that the whole thing is not filled with obscenities. Even a children's film or children's cartoons are now filled at least with grotesque images. Spongebob and the like. It's all a reflection of the heart of man. And their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. That is a description of human history. War after war. What was it? World War II was the war to end all wars? Or was it World War I? It didn't end all wars, did it? As a matter of fact, there's never peace. As one man has said, if we pass through a day that seems like there's peace in the world, it's not. It's just that both sides are reloading their guns. And that's the truth. Look at us. Just look. And then, even in our media, which proclaims that they want to have 
peace in the world, look at most of the movies. Are not most of the movies filled with violence? Filled with violence. The hero is a violent man. It's all about violence. And now even our, our fighting has evolved to become on television, to become so cruel and harsh. Do not be surprised if the days of the gladiators make its way back. Make their way back. Where we're actually watching men kill one another. Because this is the kind of people that we are. And the devil is the ringmaster of this circus. Leonard Ravenhill used to say this, the old preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, he would say, on the tombstone of America, it will be written, they entertained themselves to death. I remember my first class in philosophy in 1979, my freshman year. At the end of that course, we did a, uh, a what-if scenario, which was an absurdity, an impossibility. What if there was a machine that a young person could get into that gave them a completely different reality okay, and caused them pleasure? Would it be worth abandoning normal life in order to live within that machine and experience the pleasure of that false reality, even though their entire body deteriorated into mush. Well, we, we did arguments back and forth, but always in the context of this is an absurdity, an impossibility, something that will never happen. Video games. They entertained themselves to death. They lived not in reality. Now, the, the reason for all this, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And why is there no fear of God before their eyes? Well, in part, it's because they're immoral. They hide their head in the sand. They do not want to know the ways of the Holy One. They choose ignorance. Now, but there's another reason. Now you listen to me. When was the last time you heard most of these preachers preach on who God is? When was the last time you heard preachers preach on themes like the fear of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. My people perish for a lack of knowledge because of these false prophets that say peace, peace, when there is no peace. In Ezekiel, because of those false shepherds that build a weak wall and put on it whitewash and plaster, and it looks so nice, but when it falls, then people will ask them, where is your wall? There is no fear of God. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Now what does this mean? Many people are kind of confused on this text. It's in reality referring to the Jews. And what he's saying is now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, there's a sense in which everyone is under the law. But Paul is dealing with the Jew Gentile thing right now. And what he's basically saying is this. The Jews were given the law, the covenants, every opportunity, the temple worship and everything. So in a sense, the Jews represent, whether you like this or not, the Jews represent the best of the best. And they did not keep the law. And so what he's basically is arguing from the greater to the lesser. So if the Jews who had the law, the covenants, the temple worship, the sacrifices, everything, 
They had this, they were under the law, and yet they did not keep the law at all. What about the rest of you? None of us have kept the law. And so now, through God's revelation of the law, every mouth is closed and all the world may become accountable to God. This is necessary before you can be saved. Your mouth, with, re with regard to your own righteousness, has to be closed. You have to come to a point where you acknowledge, I have no righteousness at all before God. None. That's the only way you can be saved. And that's the purpose of the law. The law was never intended to save. It was to condemn so that men might be saved. So that men might recognize they have no righteousness and they turn to God. And then he goes in verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Why do men not want to know the law of God? Because the more they know the law of God, the more their knowledge of their own sin increases. Now, this is just a glimpse, a glimpse and nothing more. Of man's sin, for all have sinned. And then it says, fall short of the glory of God. Now. What does that mean? Well, there's been a turn in the interpretation in the last many years as as the church has become increasingly more humanistic. Fall short of the glory of God for a lot of people today means God has a wonderful plan for your life. And God's great goal is for you to fulfill that wonderful plan so that you will feel fulfilled. That's not what this text is talking about. It says we've fallen short of the glory of God. What is Romans 1? Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God nor give thanks. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God to worship corruptible things. What does it mean that we have fallen short of the glory of God? It means not that we were made, even though there's truth in it, the primary idea is not that we were made for some glorious purpose to find our fulfillment. The idea is that we were made for the glory of God. We are his. We were made for him and we were made to worship him and serve him. That's the idea. And that mankind will forever be empty, will forever be miserable unless it submits to the purpose for which it was made. Now, I make longbows that you can hunt with. They're very strong bows. They're made all out of wood. You, you, could, you could hunt a bear with one of them if you can pull it back. They're very, very good hunting bows, but you cannot play a song on them. There are people who make really good guitars, but I would not recommend going bear hunting with a guitar. It's not made for hunting bear. And my bows are not made for playing music. Things be the greatest of things become useless instruments and miserable when they are used for something for which they are not made. You were made for God. And nothing can fill you. Nothing. Nothing. It's almost as though you had an infinite hole in your heart and only something infinite can fill it. And that is God. Now, as a Christian, this becomes even greater and should be pressed upon you all the time. Nothing can fulfill you or complete you except submission and communion with God. I hear, I'll hear these marriage counselors and teachers say that your wife or your husband is supposed to complete you. Let me share with you something. If your wife or husband can complete you, then you're not a Christian. 
They can't complete you. They can't fill you. One of the reasons why there's so many divorces is because we're expecting things from our spouses they were never intended to give. My wife can't fill me. If she can, if I can be filled by another human, completed by another human, no. Only God in Christ can fulfill me and complete me. So you put all these standards on your mate, they're supposed to do things that only God can do, and when they fail you, you think you married the wrong person. You, if you are a Christian, you are such a high creature now that if someone gave you the world and all the universe, it would not complete you or fill you. And if someone took it all away from you, it would not make you empty. Because the one who both fills you, the one who fills you is God. So it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, we've gone on for about an hour and ten minutes, but I'm going to go just a little bit further because I need to get through this to get through, get through other things. The only way you can truly understand sin is in the context of who God is. God is holy. Now, what does it mean that God is holy? Many of you, when you hear that, you think it means that uh, God is without sin. Well, that's not really the primary meaning of, holy, of holiness. That's a secondary meaning. As a matter of fact, many people confuse holiness with righteousness. What does holiness mean? Holiness means in its most basic root to cut. And then it means to cut and separate. OK, to cut and separate. The holiness of God means that he is separate. That there is no one like God. To put it another way, God is not like us just bigger and better God is not like us at all it's not a quantitative difference it is a qualitative difference he's not in our category no one is in his category in one sense philosophically there is greater difference between the number one and the number two than there is between the number two and six trillion. Because once you step out of one, you've lost the uniqueness. There is other. But there is no one like God. Let me give you an illustration taken not verbatim, but taken from R.C. Sproul that I heard many, many years ago. What is more like God? An archangel? Or a worm that is crawling on the ground? Which one is more like God? The answer is neither of them. Neither of them. That God is in a completely different category. There is no comparison. All right. Right now, my head is above everyone else in this building by, by at least a half a meter, right? All right, so should I stand up here and brag that I'm closer to the sun of our solar system than the rest of you? That'd be idiotic, wouldn't it? Because I'm a half a meter closer? That means nothing in light of how far the sun is away from us. But with God, that illustration doesn't even stand. Because he's not even in a category that if you traveled far enough, you could reach to. It's an outside category. He is not like us at all. And the problem is, it enters into the heart of man. When man does not study the attributes of God as they are revealed in the scriptures, automatically he begins to think that God is like him. And that's idolatry. And that's where a great portion of evangelicalism is today. Idolatry. 
God is not like you. Or anyone else. Or even a seraphim. Now, this uniqueness can also be seen in, in this. For example, if an alien were to come down to Norway, I understand that there are already many who do live here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if a man from, or something from outer space came down to Norway, and as I was walking to my room tonight, he blew by. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, who are you? You know, I could use comparison to demonstrate who I am. Because there are seven billion other creatures on this planet pretty much like me. I could point to, I could say, well, I'm like him. I'm like him. I'm even like her. I'm like him, her, him. Look around. You want to know who I am? I am like them. Moses asked God, who are you? God said, I am who I am. He cannot point outside of himself, at least until 2000 years ago, when someone said, God, who are you? And he pointed down to Jesus of Nazareth and said, I am like him. There is no one like God. He's not in your category. You're not in his. Now, the reason why the holiness of God and sinlessness are often so brought together in the scriptures is because the one unique characteristic of man is that he is sinful. And in comparison to man, the one great characteristic about God that makes him so different from man is God is not sinful. Now, in his holiness, and his righteousness, his rightness, his ethical, his moral purity, the fact that there is no flaw in him, in that he stands against sin. Now, you know in the book of James where it says that God cannot be tempted, many people, again, greatly misunderstand this passage. They think that what it means is that when there's a temptation, God can always resist it. That's not what it means. What it means is this. There is no temptation to God. He doesn't have to resist it. He hates it. There is nothing in God that, that can cause sin to draw him to it. He hates it. You and I, even if we're Christians, we still have to deal with the fallen flesh that can be tantalized by sin and we must resist it. God doesn't have to. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that we have the most, you know, wonderful meal prepared by the best chef in Norway. And we we're very hungry. We look at it. We really want to eat it. If we do not eat it, what do we have to do? We have to resist it. Because everything in us is desiring to eat that meal. But now I, I don't want to be gross. But I'm going to be. If someone puts a plate of dog vomit in front of you, you don't have to resist it. There's nothing in that that draws out your affections. Do you see that? When God sees sin, he doesn't have to resist it. He hates it. Completely, perfectly. Now, let's talk about the hatred of God for a moment. And we need to. I know that you're all familiar with the phrase, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. I know that's you know very popular. And I will say there is some truth in the statement. The problem is the statement is not biblical and it is very misleading and it is dangerous because you're actually contradicting scripture when you say that. Because there are places in the Bible where God says he hates the sinner. Now, Yes, we must interpret it correctly, but it's there. And if you're a preacher, you have to deal with it. For example, Psalms 5, 5. God hates all those who do wrong. In some older translations, God hates all those who do iniquity. The word is hate. It means hate in Hebrew. It's really hate. That's why they put hate there. 
Now, we, when I say that, people say, well, what about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What about that? Well, my answer to you is, yes, I agree. It's in the Bible. But here's the problem. So is Psalms 5.5. 5. You see, you, you've got to stop this thing where you're looking at only one side of the coin. You've got to look at the whole thing. Because if you don't understand the hatred of God, you can't understand the love of God. First of all, people will often say, well, God can't hate because God is love. That's not true. God is love, therefore he must hate. For example, I have a special love for Jewish people. When I go to Israel, I, I hurt. I want them to come to know Christ. If I love Jewish people, I must hate the Holocaust. If I walk up to you and I say, what do you think about the Holocaust? And you go, well, I'm neutral about it. Doesn't really bother me. Then I'm going to say you're as immoral as the persons who killed them. Do you see that? If you love African Americans or Africans, you must hate slavery. If you think slavery is okay, then you don't love African Americans. If you love babies, children, you must hate abortion. And abortion must bring forth indignation on your part. Now, people say, I hear preachers say this all the time, especially evangelists. The first thing I want you to know is God's not angry with you. Well, no, that's not true. The Bible said that God is angry with the wicked every day. Let, let's just for a moment, just go with me to the book of Psalms. Hold your place in, in Romans and let's just go to the book of Psalms. First, look at Psalms 5.5. 5. It says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. I don't know if that, I hope that's your translation. In verse 6, okay, go to verse 6. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Now, men, if you're preachers, let me ask you a question. Have you preached this? Or is your preaching only one-sided? Or did you not even know this was there? Now, as far as the anger of God, look in Psalms chapter 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. It's 12 in your text. God is a righteous judge and a God who, is, who has indignation every day, who is angry every day. Now, let's just look at that for a moment. You say, well, I, that's not my God. Well, then your God is not the God of the Bible. But let's just look at some people say, well, you know, God getting angry, that's just foreign to me. I don't like that. I don't agree with it. OK, well, let's just look at something for a moment. Let's say you read in the newspaper. That a 15 year old girl was found dead yesterday. And they have come to discover that when she was five years old, she was kidnapped by a man and she was kept in that man's basement for 10 years where she was starved and beaten and raped. She escaped, but her body was so worn and so weak that when she got out into the winter before she could find refuge in someone's house or let someone know she died in the snow all alone. Now, I know that the European people are much more cultured than my people. But if you tell me that does not make you angry. I would not have very much respect for you at all. Are you going to tell me that would not make you mad? 
that would not fill you with indignation, that would not cause you to speak and say, something must be done. So we reserve that right for ourselves, don't we? We would think a person would be a monster not to be angry about something like that. So you have the right of indignation and you deny that right to God. God is holy. What you laugh about makes him angry. So when he looks at the sin that's in this world, how much does God hate sin? Adam sinned one time and the entire universe was thrown into chaos and judgment. How many times have you sinned? God is perfectly righteous. And because of that, against the wicked, he manifests his hatred in his anger. And if you go on, we have read Psalms chapter 7, verse 12 in, in your Bible. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. Now look at the next verse. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons, and he makes his arrows fiery shafts. Not only is he angry, he has intentionally, now think about this, premeditatively designed the judgment that he is going to throw down on the head of the wicked. He's designed it. He's thought about it. When we talk about the wrath of God, a good way to talk about it is calling it the settled wrath of God. That means that God isn't someone who just bursts forth without any reason. That would be frightening. But settled wrath is actually more frightening. Because what does it mean? He's sitting there. And it says in the scriptures in different places that the wrath of God against the evil men is being stored up and stored up and stored up. And he sits there and he calculates the judgment. He looks at the sin. Every crime, every sin, every moral error, every pain, and he calculates it. And the wrath is stored up and stored up until one day it bursts forth upon the world. And you say, well, Brother Paul, though, you know. Wow. What about mercy? Let me share something with you. I was preaching many, many years ago in a church. And I preached on the holiness of God one night. And all I preached on that entire night was the holiness of God. I didn't preach on anything else. I didn't mention anything else. All I preached on was the holiness of God. When I finished, there were some preachers in the back and they were angry. And they said, we are angry with you. And I said, why? They said, you are unbalanced. I said, why? They said, you preached on the holiness of God tonight. And not once did you mention his love. You're unbalanced. And I said, OK. Were you here last night? They said, yes. Last night I preached on the love of God and not once did I mention his holiness or his judgment. And none of you had a problem with that. You see, if I preach on the love of God all day long, no one has a problem with it. But if I even mention the holiness of God, people are all up in arms. This is unbalanced. This is twisted. Isn't it amazing? Some of you have never even heard a preacher talk about the hatred of God, which is in the Bible, or the anger of God. And right now you're thinking, this is unbalanced. Unbalanced? You've been a Christian for 25 years and you've never heard a preacher preach on this? I would say you are unbalanced. Do you see? Look what's happened. And some of you need to really examine your heart because you might be saying, 
My God's not like that. And look what you're doing. You say, my God is not the kind of God that sharpens his sword and has his bow bent and has made it ready and has prepared deadly weapons and fiery shafts for his enemies. My God's not like that. Then your God is not the God of this book. Because that's what I just read. He said it. Do you see that? Now, we are going to be preaching about the love of God soon, but you must understand this first. You must understand this. You see, here's what you need to understand. If God sent every man, woman, and child to hell, He wouldn't have to give any explanation for it. It's when He loves people and saves them that He has to give an explanation for it. Because He is forgiving people that ought to, by justice, be condemned. Now you say, well, Brother Paul, how does this love of God and the judgment of God, how does it work? It's very simple. God's judgment is being stored up against the wicked. And then I want you to imagine that mercy, the mercy of God, not something separate from God, God himself, his mercy. With one hand, God holds back the mercy of God holds back the wrath of God. With the other hand, the mercy of God calls sinners, come before it's too late. Come, come, come now before it's too late. So God's mercy, God's love manifests toward all men. He holds back his wrath with one hand and with the other hand, he calls men to come. Have you never read Isaiah? And again, in the book of Romans, all day long, he holds out his hand to an obstinate people. Come, come. But we all know this truth. What is going to happen one day? He's going to pull back his hand of invitation. He's going to pull back his hand that is holding back his wrath. And the only thing left for the sinner is judgment. Now, we don't have time to talk much about hell, but let me say a few things about hell in conclusion. One is, oftentimes, many of the popular preachers today, and some of them that are popular in Norway, from America, whenever they're asked about why they don't preach on hell, they usually answer this. Well, you know, we just want to, you know, preach on the love of God. We just mainly want to to teach on the teachings of Jesus. Now, when someone says that, it can mean only one of two things. They're ignorant of the teachings of Jesus or they're a liar. And I'll tell you why. If you read the Old Testament, you know what? You find almost no reference to hell. There's little, little glimpses of things, but there's no great concrete teaching. We know nothing about hell from the Old Testament. If you read the epistles of Paul and the apostles, we find very little about hell. We know almost nothing about hell from them, even though they do make reference to it. Everything we know about hell in systematic theology comes from the teachings of Jesus. Jesus taught more on hell than he did heaven. Do you see that? So when these preachers say we just want to teach the words of Jesus, they're lying to you. We wouldn't know anything about hell if it wasn't for the teachings of Jesus. Now, isn't this amazing? The one whom we all know is the most perfect, most loving, most compassionate and kindest man in the world ever. Jesus Christ, the son of God is the one who talked more about hell than everybody else in the Bible put together. Now think about that. Think about it. And isn't it amazing? Even though our primary proclamation should be the gospel and the deliverance that is found there, there is a sense in which a disciple, his goal is to be like his master. If we took that seriously, we would be talking about hell because our master talked again. Let me say it this way again. He talked more about hell 
by himself than all the other books of the Bible and all the other teachers of the Bible put together. Now, another thing that I want you to know about hell. When we think of hell, most people have this idea of Dante's Inferno. Whether in art or in literature. We have this idea of hell as this horribly dark place where demons are torturing people gleefully with pitchforks and all this kind of stuff. That is Dante's Inferno. That's not the Bible. What is hell? It is where God gives to every man exactly to the final penny what they deserve. It is the place of perfect justice. That's what hell is. And you think, oh, that's not so bad. Wow, that's better. No, you're not hearing me. It is the place of perfect justice. You see, here's our problem. We don't know how evil sin is. And therefore, we don't understand the degree in which it must be punished. Every last thought, every word, every act will be paid to the very last cent. Now remember this, Adam sinned and the entire universe was thrown under judgment. It's perfect justice. It is also a place, taking this from Romans 1, an extension of being delivered over to your own lusts. A place where the conscience that was given you by God is removed. A place where every shred of grace that had been given you to restrain your evil is taken away. I do think C.S. Lewis had it right when he talked about, in some degree, I'm not going to verbatim, but the idea is this, that there is no common person. And what he means by that, and what I mean by that is every person you see will one day, if in Christ, be so glorious a person that if you saw them in their future glory now, you would have a tendency to fall down and want to worship. Or every person will be a monster beyond any of the hellish thought of Hollywood, beyond any horror you have ever, ever conceived. There are no common people. They will spend eternity as glory or eternity as monstrous. Turned over to their own evil. And not wanting freedom. Let me give you an example. And we'll close here. There are places in Southeast Asia where men go. Horrible places. Drugs, opium, little children being prostituted everywhere, all in one room. I want you to think about something. I mean, beyond any horror you could imagine exists right now and it's going on with little tiny children. If I could all of a sudden snap my fingers and transport you to that very place and you opened your eyes, you opened your eyes and there you were, you would think you were in hell. The things that you would see, monstrous, horrifying, terrifying things. They'd make you throw up. You'd never forget it. You need counseling for the rest of your life. And yet think about this. There are businessmen in Europe and America that pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go there 
and enjoy it. All the while gnashing their own tongues because they have no satisfaction, no peace. In hell, men are turned over to what they really are. Without the grace of God, monsters. Now this has been dark. But it needs to be dark. You see, let me ask you a question. Where did all the stars go? Think about it. They're not there in the sky. Did some gigantic troll come and put them in a basket and carry them to the other side of the planet? Where did all the stars go? Well, they're still there, aren't they? But you can't see them. Why can't you see them? Too much light. Sun came up. The stars are still there. When can you best see the stars? In the pitch black of night. When can you best see the grace of God? When it's displayed upon the radical depravity of man. That's why I drew such a dark picture. So that when we return and talk about salvation, you'll see that it is salvation. You see, you think almost that, well, it's right. God wouldn't be God if he didn't save you. That's not true. Tozer said, if all the world was blind, it wouldn't diminish the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars. They'd still be just as glorious. And if all men were cast into hell, it would not diminish or lessen God. He would still be God in the fullness of all his attributes. You think God had to save you? He did not. Satan fell and the angels far superior, far more beautiful than you. Did he send them a savior? He did not. Did he have to send you one? He did not. The fact that he did is the marvel of marvels. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that instructs us and sets before us the darkness of our lives so that when Christ shines, we see it as true light, true light. And we marvel at its beauty. In Jesus' name.